Well, hello there, chess fans. The second half of the candidates tournament is underway. That means everybody's now playing the same person they've already played, but with the opposite colors, that being round one and round eight parallel each other. Peter Svidler takes on his own countrymen, both of them defending the motherland to start, but now Sergei Karyakin doing doing the better of the two. Peter Svidler, once again, though, produces one of the most exciting games of the tournament, if you ask me, and it's full of back-and-forth chess, some mistakes by both sides, but that makes me happy, allows me to discuss some instructive moments, and gets us excited about all the different tactics and the woulda, coulda, shouldas. Next, we had Aronian versus Gary, where a little bit disappointing, they repeated a game they played not even more than just a month and a half ago at the Zurich Chess Challenge, and Aronian doesn't play anything that special as far as an improvement on his previous play, and the game, once again, ends peacefully. In the third round, we had Topolov play the more concrete way for an advantage, at least as far as my analysis went when I evaluated Geary's play versus Anon from just the previous round, the game that ended in, in a very short draw, as we, as we all remember. Topolov tries for a little more, but essentially we get a QGD where both sides really just knew exactly what the best plans for and didn't give the other much. It's instructive for us, though, as we have some nice minority attack and Queen's Gambit ideas that we can take home and put in our pocket and learn from. So definitely stick around for the third game. Finally, the battle between the two Americans was the game of the day. Fabiano Caruana winning today. The only the only decisive game of the round as he takes down a Nakamura and once again the oxymoron of a very exciting Berlin. We actually had the King's Castle the opposite sides of the board. Things got weird and wild and crazy and and we had a, a very interesting checkmate attack develop for both sides with a Nakamura misplaying the critical pawn push according to MBL's analysis, and ultimately that was what decided the game. So let's jump right in with that preview being under our belt and see what happened here between Peter Svidler and Karyakin, the two Russians. Now, we've seen this English played a few times. If you remember, just uh, just a few rounds ago, Topolov played the move knight to d5 here against Aronian. We've also seen the English by Svidler, previous round against Kar Karwana. So we've seen this before. After e4, knight g5, now we're officially in a line that hasn't been played before. Rook to e8, f3, this is a very common move that tries to handle the dysfunction, especially of the knight on g5. Obviously, the knight doesn't want to end up on h3, right? So f3 is played, and now we get our first sort of surprising move of the game. When, when black chose here to play e3, rather than e takes f3. e3. e takes f3 is definitely the more common move, especially at the highest levels. And after we make a few moves, I can say that this position has been played by multiple players in this candidate's tournament for both sides. And so it's a very topical variation of the English. The last super GM I saw really playing this line in the database was Tomaszewski is white. So you can check out those games if you wish. But we're not going to focus on that. We're focused on E3 because that's what Karyakin did. And after D3, D5, and then Queen A4 by Svidler, we have a... Um, we're already starting to get into original territory. I wondered if maybe Karyakin surprised Svidler with the E3 ID. I did not see the post-game commentary, so I couldn't uh, expound any more upon that. Queen to B3 is the main move that had been played before, but after reviewing multiple games in the database, I'll say that this seems to be a pretty solid approach for black and, and white's not getting too much. So instead, if what if you what if you instead of bringing the queen out, just take on d5? Well, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And after something like this, where the knight is kicked from e4, black is scoring very well. In fact, nearly 75% in this position in the database. So so that's also not good. So whether Fiddler was surprised or not, I mean, he played a move that makes sense given that neither of the other two really packs a whole lot of punch. After h6, we take on d5 and now go to e4. Of course, black is still going to go for the f5 idea, but now with the queen being out. And having induced this a6 move maybe as a weakness, that might be something that White uh, is hoping to exploit later on. And, and I already know the game, so I'm foreshadowing something I already knew. What a, way to go, Danny. That makes sense. Uh, but of course, this c3 pawn is not really going to be capturable because of checks by the queen on the diagonal. In case you're thinking about that, don't get too excited. Here, Karyakin played f4, uh, queen to d6, rook to b8, b6. Uh, not b6 right away, but queen to d6, defending the knight so that b6 can be an idea. It are also moves here. F4 is a very committal move. Black is saying, I want to create something on the king side. But what's the problem with F4? Well, it, it gives the knight this E4 square back. Now, I say problem sort of loosely because both sides had pretty equal chances until we got to those back and forth mistakes I already alluded to. But I will say here, probably Svidler gets a little bit too excited about the, about the weaknesses of F4 and the idea of putting the pony back on E4 and driving the G-pawn. We're going to see that this was ultimately a plan that could have led Peter very astray, and it didn't. Uh, and then ultimately, maybe it helped get his winning position. It's, it's, it was all it was all a messy a messy uh, scenario later on. But but bishop to b2 was played here with the idea of c4 and with the idea of of going for that plan. 
So I, even though I, I can't really say bishop b2 is a mistake, I think c4 definitely was. Really getting too excited about playing on the king side because it weakens the d4 square. This should have been something that really backfired for white. We're going to touch on that in a second. After knight e7, g4, b6, and then the knight comes into d4. Oh, sorry, not yet. We get to the critical moment. The uh, let's stop. Let's stop and take stock here for a second. So we have one a very interesting position because how often do you see this pawn structure, right? Unless you're playing with your you know seven year old nephew and you're just enjoying making weird Swiss cheese of the position, right? Where there's just all kinds of holes, and then Tom and Jerry show up, and you ask yourself, why did I watch cartoons with so much violence, right? Uh, you know, but seriously, it's it's a strange position. It's not a very common structure. And with that, you get a very awkwardly, potentially bad bishop. You also get this horribly weak square. But white does have the bishop pair, and currently the only dark squared uh, long-range piece on the board. So it, it's an unbalanced position. But, but c4 was a move that, as I'm going to say, I think really had the potential to backfire. White, white could have built on the position a little more slowly first. But Peter did it with this idea in mind. As I said, he wanted to get g5. And the problem with g5 was not what actually was played. Karyakin was in love with Harry the H-pawn and, and played H5. And then, fun fact, Peter Svidler tried to play on Passant and had to be told that's not the rule. It's just kidding. That's a made-up story. Uh, but the move that would have been hilarious and would have been really strong is if Karyakin had taken on G5. Why hilarious? Because it seems just like a terrible move. I wonder if both players just dismissed it. But after knight takes G5, knight to F5, unleashing the queen attacking, suddenly it seems like black is almost just winning in the position. If the queen takes on c6 and black gobbles up the knight, there's almost no way to deal with the threat of knight h4 and mate on g2. If king h1, we have a very nice tactic that goes like this, check and then takes here and bobs your uncle. Black is just crushing through. So uh, g5 was not taken by Karyarkin, but again, this is a pretty concrete line that I had, uh, I had my big um, reptilian friend with me and, and it looks like black would have just won upon renewed threats of things like g4 and maybe just been winning already in the position, but, but Karyakin didn't do it. Instead, he played h5, and now after rook to d1, he gets the knight to d4, which is, which is not that bad. It's, it's what we wanted to see. It was black exposed to dark squares. But in, in a couple moves here, now Karyakin's playing pretty much all the best moves. In a couple moves here, we have the critical moment, and that's after h4, queen c3, bishop of 5 where Svidler plays the old play a horrible move gambit, and maybe your opponent will play a horrible move right back. That's exactly what happens here. When he plays the move h3. A sheepka. Mistake. The, the reason it was a mistake, though, is not because of what Karyakin did. An absolutely amazing computer line is about to be shown on the board. Are you ready to have your mind blown? <laughs> like, seriously, make sure you use that emoji when you talk about this video later, like that mind blown emoji. This, the, okay, the idea behind h3 is that white is, is actually hoping for black to take it and eliminate the idea of, of, of eliminating the knight. See, what black would really like to do, if, if everything was perfect, would be eventually put a pony on d4, dominate the dark squares, reinforce that pony with a pawn on c5. That, imagine that knight on d4 versus that bishop on g2, and you can pretty much understand why black wants that. And then just take on e4. If black is able to eliminate this knight, not only will he have the good knight versus bad bishop situation I'm prophesizing, but also the g5 pawn becomes immediately weak without the pony on the board. All kinds of stuff. And those positional things I'm talking about, the control over the dark squares, the potential good knight versus bad bishop position, the elimination of this knight and what it could do to white's kingside, are actually the reasons why h3 was a big mistake. And the reasons why what white needed to do was be much more aggressive with sort of a standard move, a4, a5, try to get more pieces into this game and try to create counterplay. But neither side realized it, and after h3, not only did Karyakin take it, which helped, but he missed this incredible line by the computer. I'm starting with knight to c6. The threat is very simple. I'm going to bring the pony to d4 and fork you on e2, right? That's not a happy thing, so you play queen e1, which not only th uh, defends that threat, but this is probably what the players saw. And Karyakin's thinking, I don't want to lose the h-pawn, but here's the idea. Knight comes to d4 anyway. After the knight goes to c3, because losing this pawn would be reckless, and white is trying to prevent the idea of good knight versus bad bishop, we get the amazing and shocking, probably the move that was just not even considered, king to f7. And after takes, queen to d6 guards the f-pawn, we don't even need it. In fact, after another check, the computer says king e6, 
Black's position is completely safe, and actually white will be checkmated on the H-file soon. A whole lot of analysis over at the news report at chess.com will prove that I looked at it deeply, but I'll give you a quick line. G6 is met by this and this, and that's Ouchtown, Populations Fiddler. Uh, bringing the queen back on the diagonal is, is also just leading to a very quick mate on the H-file. The king can run, the queen can slide, or the rooks will just do their own dirty work. And look at a position where the, the center is so close, this king couldn't run away and scream help if he wanted to. It, it's really interesting to see that the positional features here, the dark square control and the bind with the bad bishop, were really where black needed to focus, not on the extra pawn. And... How much Svidler sensed that or not is interesting because maybe he did and he was trying to bait, bait Karyakin. Uh, no one really knows. Again, I didn't listen to the news report, so usually Peter adds confirmation of those things sometimes to my notes. But after Bishop takes h3, Karyakin fell for the bait and uh, Svidler doesn't look back. He immediately plays queen e5. This game is very rich. I know this has been long, but don't go anywhere. Now we have a whole other brilliant idea played by Svidler. Because once queen e5 and then queen d 5 check was played, we ended up heading into an endgame here where it was actually all of a sudden white who has the upper hand, despite the lost pawn that he lost on h3, because either black will now have to concede the light square diagonal, which uh, the computer says is maybe okay for black, but it just seems counterproductive to me, or take as he did and help the white king get up. So black's next few moves are designed to create counterplay on the queen side desperately before, before white just has a much more active king and picks off these weak and overextended pawns over here, right? So black plays natural moves. He plays rook a3 and then brings the other rook over. Now he's going to bring the king up and bring the knight over, especially if he gets the e5 square, preventing this, this from here. By the way, takes it would walk into a, uh, a checkmate in one move, so, so don't hurt yourself. But it gets more exciting. After rook to b1, regardless of what happens up till now, I think it was an interesting English. We saw that probably Karyakin had multiple opportunities to get the upper hand, especially this really nice idea of just bringing that knight to d4 and, and the Komodo king walk out to e6. But now in this position, it's Fiddler who could have the upper hand if Karyakin's not careful, and he wasn't. He played the move king to g6, which I think did two things wrong. One, it overestimated the value of getting the king active here and underestimated the potential of white breaking through, not because the queen side was going to fall apart, but because it was going to lead to something over here. And I think that's where Karyakin really misstepped. The move I analyzed that was definitely the best was rook a6. This move would have uh, maintained the balance. White's still got a little bit of pressure, but it's probably still going to end up in a draw. In the game, after king to g6, here we go. d6 comes first. We crash through and open the b file. And now once the d6 pawn falls, we're immediately preparing a very, very nice idea that's going to find this black king in a mating net. Now, I analyzed that probably this is Karyakin's last concrete chance for a draw. Maybe something like knight to d7. I think white still has a slight edge. But the point is, if you play tickle with this rook and the rook moves, now the choice is either go back and repeat, take here, which allows me to take, and though white's a little better in the rook ending, it's definitely better drawing chances for Karyakin, or move the knight, and now I'll, now I'll support my knight, and I've actually prevented you from doing your worst things over there on the king side. So I think that was the last moment for Karyakin to really concretely be holding. Um, remember earlier, he could have been winning. That's why this game has been so fun to review. But he didn't. He played rook d to a8, the natural move that, that says, hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to go back and go after the a-file. But this is when it gets messy. Rook to b5 attacks the knight. The knight finds a safe square. Still, what's the big deal, Dan? Here's the big deal. g6 check. Sacrificing this pawn opening up the, the, the fifth rank for the rook, followed by a very surprising rook swing, rook to c1 and rook to g1. So back things up and ask yourself, as Fiddler probably saw the idea here, he probably did. The point is, I'm actually going to sack the pawn to open lines for the rooks to work together and then swing my rooks, and suddenly this king finds itself in a very, very dangerous mating net where the rooks, the rooks, the knights, the rooks, everybody's working together to just put the hurt on that guy. So king h7 is played, trying to run. White plays rook to g1. And after rook a7, rook g4, a few forced moves. Gobble, gobble the pawn was correct, but in this moment here was where this whole combination started with g6, could have been cashed in on by Svidler. Gotta, gotta give your heart out to the guy again, failing to convert on nearly a plus two position probably from the computer. He commits to the wrong plan. And I'm, I'm going to explain why I think it was an understandable blunder. Okay, he... Here's what he does. He plays rook g to h4, but let me explain why I think that was an understandable blunder. All right. If in the main line, if instead of knight to f8, okay, or sorry, after knight f8, sorry, I'm trying to find my analysis here. So many. Okay. If in the main line, 
a lot of you might have been wondering in the main line, like, why does the knight have to come back? What if black goes for his own counterplay? Well, let me show you what happens. After rook takes a2, rook takes h4, we're threatening checkmate on the h-file. And this very powerful battery is going to force the king to run. And now once we start gobbling things up with check, white actually has this very brilliant rook d5, keeping the king corralled. And a few more forcing moves. There's actually multiple lines that win for white, but I wanted to show at least one. A very nice little maneuver from the rook, followed by rook to g4, and the king hunt is just on. Black is, uh, black is in big trouble, just losing. So, but remember the whole thing started with the, the point that we were preventing rook takes a2 because of the, of the battery on the h-file. That idea, I think, stuck in Spiddler's head psychologically, and he, he was expecting that to be a really key point to create damage. Also, if rook takes a2 takes, g6 doesn't work, because now we check and check here, which is going to force black to give up the exchange, which is also losing. So... This whole attack being based on this, this double on the H-file idea, I think when, when Black played 97 and he gobbled up, he was sort of thinking that this, this should work somehow, right? I mean, look at it. How dangerous does this look? Doesn't it feel like Black has just made it in a couple, you know, hop, skip, and a jump away? But no, actually, White, white is needing to, to bring pressure to a different critical point in the position. And the winning move here, the easiest winning move, is Rook to E5. The difference between playing it now and when it could have been played after taking the f-pawn is that this move actually prevents rook takes a2 once again because rook e7 is just lights out. Literally, you can just resign. I'm either mating you with the rooks here or if you play this, I relocate the knight for some sort of Anastasia special over here on the h-file. So, so that's it. So rook e5 was the move. And black, is, black has no good moves here. I'm, I'm gobbling up here. I'm continuing the mating attack. I'm also threatening knight f5, by the way. So I had a whole bunch of lines analyzed. Let's see, not just rook takes a2, but rook to d7. And now after knight f5 and then check, we actually just go gobble up the e-pawn with the knight, which guards e2. And probably black is going to lose this and this pawn eventually for nothing. So that's one line that wins. Um, you know, of course, knight to d7 is just going to allow rook in. And again, we're losing. So, so rook e5 was... was was the move that I'm confident Spither would have won with. Instead, frustrated with rook g h4 not working, he plays it once, and then instead of playing it twice, he, he, he gives in and plays rook takes f4. But after rook takes a2, already now the, the game has changed. White doesn't have the immediate pressure here, so there's no knight f5 punch, there's no double rook punch here like I wanted, and the fact that, the fact that White didn't have those caused Spither to panic. He played the move rook f to h4, but after g6, rook e5, he simply offered a draw. Now, I actually analyzed it further, and I still think his draw was a little premature. I, I think that if he had played rook takes e5, and now again, a really nice rook swing, the rook comes back to the c file. It's hard to judge these guys. They're the ones playing long games. I'm not, but I, I think white is still the only one who can win here. So it's a little disappointing to see Spither not push on. A few more moves I analyzed show that if the rook just sits, white actually has a plan of c5 and then f4 where the king will eventually come here. This knight can still go to e4. Uh, white, is, white is in the driver's seat here. Where we're driving, I don't know. Hopefully it's Disneyland. But, but that's, um, that's what I think Spither could have done. He didn't. He missed the win earlier. Karyakin missed the win before that. Maybe it's all poetic justice in the end. I don't really understand karma, but I do know chess. So, so let's move on to the next video. Sorry, to the next game. Now, as I said in our next game between Aronian and Geary, we, we just see a repeat of the game played in Zurich not more than a month and a half, and a, a month and a half ago. Noted is that Geary once again declines not to challenge White in this uh, bot Vinic semi-slav. I wonder if the top players just know that the bot Vinic semi-slav is, sol is solved and the rest of us don't. I wonder if I can learn how to speak without twisting up my own tongue. But uh, they, they don't seem to play that much anymore. But h6 is played, and now pretty much White has to take on f6. If you don't believe me, look up the lines that occur after bishop h4 and then taking here. The difference is that in those Bodvinic Slavs, Black has lots of G5 shots, unpinning the knight in the right moment. And I'm oversimplifying complicated theory, but it's, it's doing well for Black. So Bishop takes F6, followed by a number of moves are possible. I used to play Queen to C2 back when I played, uh, semi-professionally at least. Uh, Queen to B3 was played in this game, but also E3 was played recently by Carlson. There's all kinds of moves here for White. After Queen to B3 takes, Queen takes, and now Knight to D7, we are still just in mainline theory. Note it should be that e4 aggressively seems like the right thing that most people who play the Queen's Gambit would want to do when they have the chance. But in a lot of these positions where black has developed solidly and has the bishop pair, he's happy to meet e4 with e5. And 
this is, uh, this is just a common way for black to liberate the pawn structure. We've talked about the Kirillov structure a lot in a whole video series I have over on chess.com, which you can check out. But as long as black is getting one of these moves safely and opening up the bishops, usually he's uh, liberating the pieces and equalizing. Main lines go like this with d5, knight b6, and then bishop c5. And we have a double-edged game, but I think I prefer black from a practical perspective because of the bishop pair. So that'll be all I'll say on that. Now we'll continue with e3 played, and after g6... Knight e4, queen e7. This is exactly the game they played in Zurich, as I mentioned. A3 is the only real way to try to stop the endgame, but uh, it's never been played before, and the top players probably have this completely prepped out as to why. But e5 right away is an idea. f5 is an idea, but so is, so is f5 followed by bishop g7, and then eventually e5, which is why I noted it. I think that's probably the most solid for black. So instead, uh, Aronian continues with the move that was already been, has already been played, knight e5. We get a check. We get a trade into the end game, not by black taking here, because that would be exactly the kind of grip that white wants on the dark squares. But instead going back to e7, and now after f3, we have our first novelty. f4 was the move that was played in Zurich. You can go check that game out if you want. But f3 was played, and, and it doesn't pack a lot of pizzazz with it, right? No fireworks in terms of that novelty. I guess white just wanted to maintain a little bit more of the tension in the position, a little more flexibility. So after rook to g8, rook to c1, f5, it's time to trade. I did analyze knight to c5 check, but I think a few things. I think king c7 is possible. I guess I'll show you the analysis. Uh, although this might bring me to my ultimate goal, which is to get the knight on e5. I think that's where Aronian's real chances were. Uh, but also, I think that black could probably just take on c5. And, and this endgame, maybe white's a teeny weensy bit better because of the backward c6 pawn on the open file. And black doesn't have one of those to target himself in white structure. But I doubt it's enough to really write home about. So... So likely that's why they're not playing this, at least as far as Aronian wanting to win his white. He plays the move knight to do, which has eventual goals of getting here, and, and that's exactly why uh, Geary meets it with b6 and then bishop to f6. At some point here, there you go, bishop f6. All, all other moves were just natural developing moves. And after b4, rook to g7, bishop to e2, we have g5, and we're heading to a position where because black is now starting to open up lines, you don't want the rooks getting crazy on the g-file, right? And you don't want the bishops getting too many open diagonals. Maybe if this pawn disappears, there's threats of e5 and c5. Because black started to, to bring the pressure as far as opening up lines for the bishops is where Aronian, I think, realized that his improvement of f3 really wasn't worth too much, and, and we end up getting a, a draw very quickly here. It's possible that f takes and then h5 is interesting. It does create a passed h-pawn, but I felt that both g4, which cuts off the bishop, and, and even rook h8, with the idea of doing it later, both maintain decent chances. But uh, after g4, and then my idea is eventually c5, it seems, again, that black is going to be getting the upper hand of this endgame. And this h-pawn isn't queening fast enough. So I'm, I'm, of course, when I analyze these games, always trying to prove the players wrong, as if I have the right, just to try to say, hey, here's how they could have played for more of a win than they did, right? We're tired of these draws, right? Stick it to the man. And, and then I end up realizing that they pretty much played all the best moves, and that's why it was a draw. It's unfortunate. But after g5, I couldn't justify f takes and h5 because of g4 and c5, as I said. So that means that what they did with h takes here and then, and then trades and, and now recognizing that the best plan was to bring the knight into c4 is exactly what the best thing was. First, white needs to play bishop f3 because you're worried about discoveries here where the rook and bishop meet up. So instead, after bishop f3, bishop a6, now it, it is for Aronian to decide, do I have any plans in the position, or am I just going to play knight to c4 and allow the opposite code bishop ending? He decided on the latter, but again, trying to analyze and justify something better, I couldn't do it. I feel like black is already starting to get a little bit of the better hand here. The bishop pair might come to life, and a plan like g3 is a little too slow after the nice move I found, bishop e7, exclam of Iach, relocating the bishop. And we might end up getting a position like this where white has 99 problems and the g-pawn is one of them. And, uh, and that's going to be a real issue later on. So instead of that, Aronian recognizes not enough has been had. Time to play knight c4. Maybe he'll let me play knight e5 check. And eh, not happening. So it's not to say the obstacle bishop ending is just an immediate draw. But obviously you look at these positions where no side has a real critical weakness to speak of. There's not even a material advantage. One pawn or two sometimes are still draws. And there's not of that, nothing like that here. So you expect it to be a draw. Now, Geary didn't have to play e5, but I gave it an x clam because if black is a little bit worse and doesn't want to play the endgame where white's just going to gang up on the c-pawn, maybe you're still drawing in those lines because of the obstacle bishops, but why allow it? As long as your king isn't going to get mated, why not sack the pawn and immediately activate the king? I loved the idea by Geary, and it leads to some forced lines where 
Black's active king forces a trade of c for e, c for e. And uh, okay, I gave one last line that maybe in this position here, instead of taking e7, that one last trick was this. Uh, there's no check. See if black takes it. And uh, of course, if the king would have come here, we would have gotten a discovered check and win the piece. That was my trick. And now we get king here. And, and I think if, if you can't guard the bishop with rook g8, you have to move it. If I can win the f pawn, is this position still probably a draw? Yes. But my, my analysis was, okay, king f3 might have been the last chance for, for, for Geary to fall into a pit. Of course, he doesn't have to take it, and he can even play probably just a move like rook g7, keeping the rooks on the board, and, and Bob's st still probably the uncle, which means draw. I'm not even sure if that means draw, but that's how I translated it. So that wasn't played. Instead, we, we had the move played in the game, which was just rook takes, and in a few moves, we agreed to a draw. So interesting from, I guess, I guess we learned a little bit about the potential dangers of play, facing a bishop pair in the endgame. I don't know if Aronian's going to give up trying to get a slight edge in this endgame. He's now tried it twice in the last month and a half. Time will tell, but it's not our job to predict the future. Let's talk about the next game between Topalov and Anand. Now here we saw the same opening as I already to in the pairings preview, where we review what happened in the round. We saw the same opening tried by Geary against Anand. Topalov says, I'm gonna try to get a little more than Geary by taking on d5. And if you wanna remind yourself of why I felt like this was the more concrete edge, you can check out the previous video, video. but real quick summary is that it opens the C file, which is gonna make it harder to get C5. And even if black does, we will end up with an isolated pawn eventually. So. Uh, yes, the most solid way for black to play is what Anand did in the game, which is to get this minority attack type position, but I, I still think this is the better try for Topalov that he did. Now, he played a3. Bishop to g5 is the move that I mentioned in that video and in the analysis of that news report that is kind of the main line. Uh, but Topalov plays a3, which gains the bishop pair, but loses some time. So if we're quickly taking stock of what kind of game are we going to have, well, white's going to have the bishop pair. And with it, a, an open C file and a potential for a minority attack, Queen's Gambit kind of play, and, and Black has a small lead in development from what he normally has as Black in a QGD, and early early control over the light square. So, so that's kind of the balance in, in, in terms of what both sides have. Castles, C, E3, Rook to E8, this is all normal, C6. And now after Bishop to D3, we're officially in an original kind of position here, but a very... A uh, very familiar position for anybody who plays d4 regularly or d5 as black. This is a queen's gambit declined. What you have here is open lines for black toward the king. And I maybe even use a rook lift, but I'm definitely going to use squares by the ponies and by the queen to try to coordinate aggressive intentions on the king side. Positionally, however, white is usually a little bit better. Why? Because the minority attack is something that can't be stopped. The minority attack is a two versus three pawn storm, which uses the strength of read between the lines. If you have two versus three, that means by definition you have an open file. And we're using the strength of the open file to target the c6 pawn. Once we get there, it'll either become a backward pawn uh, by us taking it. You'll take it, which will isolate this pawn, or you'll push it, which will also isolate this. So in a perfect world, I just sort of summarize the minority attack for you in 30 seconds, and that's what white might try to do. But after bishop to b2, bishop f5, castles, queen f6, knight e5, all typical QGD stuff, I think that already here, after Anon plays knight to d6, which I really liked, I'm already just feeling like white got nothing out of the opening. I would say that if you're going to go for the minority attack, you kind of need to do so now. Play a4 first, be a little more subtle, so that when you do play b4, you're immediately threatening this. Also, a4 sometimes opens up this diagonal for the bishop, who hasn't really found a very happy home behind his d-pawn, right? So that's another idea that I would have suggested a4. But after knight to d6, why do I like this move so much? Well, it does two things, recognizing very deeply what white's only real plans are in the position. White's plans are the minority attack, as I highlighted, and the knight on d6 will not only help to trade off the bishops, but if you ever play b4 now, the c4 square comes immediately under my gaze, and I love that, and I'm slowing down b5. So the knight on d6 is helpful in many ways for stopping the minority attack. But the other plan White has, and the reason he played knight e5, is the second queen's gambit plan of the minority attack you should make note of if you play these openings, which is to play f3 and e4. If white got a few moves, you might even see rook a to e1, f3, and e4 happen instead in instead of the minority attack because it, it's a little more fun and a little more aggressive. But knight d6 doesn't allow those things to happen, at least not with tempo. After rook a to e1, we trade and then bring the queen over. Again, f3 can be played here, which is what Kar uh, sorry Topalov did, but it no longer came with tempo. The knight was already patiently waiting for a track to explode on. Hashtag Eminem reference on d6. Still, if you played before, we get this, and I'm preventing this. 
So Anand has, has done everything he's supposed to do on the black side of a QGD. Seriously, this is like what we call a STEM game, meaning if you're somebody who wants to know how to get good in an opening, usually you want to ask yourself, who are my STEM players and my STEM games? STEM players are top players in the world who regularly feature your ECO code. Always know who they are, follow their games, and learn from how they play your openings. STEM games are some of the best games by those players. Like if you ask me the openings I play, I can tell you a few STEM games that sort of in history were very important games in those lines, and they sort of represent common patterns and ideas for me. So this is a very just very straightforward game by a nod, very, very just textbook goodness by Black and the QGD. So after a4, 96, now it's time for white to either put up or shut up, right? Either we're going to play rookie two and, and try to double things and go for this, or we're going to end up making a big trade. Unfortunately, Tabalov, Tabalov already starts tipping his hand with queen d2 that he's going to try to trade instead of, instead of playing rookie two. And after h5, bishop a3, knight f5, he realizes that, okay, I can't play e4 because d4 hangs, and probably if I play something like rookie two now as I analyzed, h4 comes and... And if anybody's getting pressure on the king side, it's probably black. So Topolov says, well, I've done my best. I'm going to play knight f4, and let's simplify everything on the e file and play tickle for a little while. What do I mean by tickle? Just watch. Do, 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 back and forth with the queen and the bishop, the queen and the bishop. Just just no side really doing anything. Uh, not to over overdo it, I'll say that... Both sides have a different duo. We have a queen and bishop versus a queen and knight. How could both sides lose the game? Well, black could lose the game if he creates too many pawns on dark squares and then actually gives access points. Pawns on dark squares themselves can restrict the bishop. But if you, if you put pawns permanently on dark squares and then somehow traded queens and let this bishop come around, you may have some serious problems. So as long as black doesn't allow that, he's going to be fine, pretty much. The queen and bishop aren't going to work very well together for an attack. The queen and knight, on the other hand, will work well together for an attack on the king's side. But how can black lose the game? I mean, sorry, how can white lose the game? By the king becoming under attack by the queen and knight. But that's actually another way black could lose the game. And I analyzed that because I was like, hmm, at some point, didn't Anon want to play a move like knight f5 and then h4 and, and, and try to flex the muscles of the most dynamic duo that ever existed, Batman and Robin? But no, unfortunately, if he does, here comes g4. And actually, a very simple back to g2. And I started thinking that anytime we go for this, we're actually making h4 weaker, uh, maybe creating more chances for white in the process, and probably, Kar uh, why do I keep calling him Kar Karyakin? Topolov and Anon felt the same way. After f5, I looked at a line that might go like this, where it really shows that with all out aggressive, you know, balls to the walls intention, Black still may end up being the one who ends up losing it if this attack doesn't go anywhere. Although knight f6 found by Komodo might actually make a real mess of things. So anyway, it's it's the, the point is that there's just not enough here for either side. If, if one side risks it, the other side might get the biscuit, right? You get it. So the queen and bishop, they want dark square weaknesses, but black's not going to give it to them. The queen and knight want to checkmate the king, but doing so creates their own risks. And so because of that, they, uh, they didn't play knight f5. Instead, Anand played tickle one more time. Finally infiltrated, and because of that, forced the hand of Paul up to trade, and we get this nice, cute little position where g5 is played, and actually met by a nice move here to save the game. Moving the knight to any other square but the square that he did would allow f4. White undoubles the pawns, and then probably starts picking up some dark square weaknesses, as exactly as I said, right? This, this is the kind of thing you don't want to see, where the bishop is getting what it needs, as I, as I said, would be the one way black could lose. But Anand didn't go for this line without having already calculated it probably all the way back here, right? He knew what kind of endgame he was going to get, and that endgame was a king and pawn ending with the brilliant knight f4, which goes into this weird position where white just can't take the pawn because then he loses on the king side because of past pawns. And so they simply agreed to withdraw after king to g2, and with it, we had our third draw of the game, which leads us to our only decisive game, the game of the day between Fabiona Caruana and Hikaru Nakamura. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Do I still even need to tell you who the man is behind all this stuff, MVL, and go check out his analysis at chess.com? If I do, that's clearly a you problem at this point. So instead, let's continue and jump right in to how Caruana took down his countrymen. We have the Rui Lopez and a Berlin and another 4d3 line. After bishop to c5, we have our first bishop takes c6. So as uh, MVL says, this is an anti-Berlin that's possible. He said he doesn't like it. He prefers not taking on c6 without being prompted. 
by the bishop feels like it's a little bit too committal and voluntary, but, but it's very popular and certainly playable for white. And it also gives black the dynamic chances that, that Hikaru took in the game. And maybe that's what Caruana wanted, was a chance for both sides to play for the win. I think both these guys were ready to try to get a win and get one of them back into the tournament. And that's exactly what happened. I'm not suggesting any collusion, believe me. I'm just saying that both sides wanted to win this game. So after, after D takes C6, Knight B to D2, castle short. The key here revealed by Caruana when he plays Queen E2 is, hmm, maybe we smell a rat. Maybe white's not intending on castling short, right? Maybe white wants to castle long and mix things up. After rook to E8, knight to C4, and then bishop to D2, that seems exactly where we're headed. And the, the hand was totally tipped when he just grabbed the king and moved it to C1. So how do we evaluate this race position? Well, as MVL says, he says casting long was never the most common approach, uh, but it's definitely gotten a boost in popularity recently. White just has to be willing to play super dynamic chess. You're giving black tempos and the mating attack that, that you also want. But in this game, we saw a little bit of a novelty idea by Carwana, which I think was the key point to, to him going for it. Let's get to it. After b5, we go back. We don't really want to take and, and undouble the c pawns. It also opens up the queen. So it's kind of in our interest to not do that. And after knight f5, a4, all seems well for black. The pawns are coming. The pawns are coming. But then bishop to g5 is played. And as MVL said, this at first seems strange because normally black has no problem putting a pawn on f6 in the Berlin. The pawn on f6 re strengthens the center. It's actually very common to have th this structure you see in the game with, with the pawns like this and the bishop here. Very solid for black. We can play c5 and we've just completely gripped the dark squares. So normally bishop g5 would be a move with, that would be laughed at because that's exactly what black wants. But because the kings are on opposite sides of the board, this move was key in inducing weaknesses for Caruana. Was it prepared? I, I would tend to think yes, uh, before you went into the most aggressive possible line in this anti-Berlin by castling long in a checkmate attack, probably, but who knows. I think bishop g5 was probably prepared, though. Uh, MVL gives a whole bunch of analysis to knight f6, saying that as, counter, as counterintuitive as it looks, maybe it was also possible for black, though white still maintains a small edge. We're going to go with f6, bishop e3, and then see exactly what the doctor ordered, where both sides are going for the pawn storm. This is all out, right, exciting chess, as I tweeted. Is, is, like, is anybody more excited about this? This is what we want to see. Players, let's go checkmate each other, shall we? So after bishop to e6, king to b1, b4 comes, and here comes g5. There's really not much else to say besides whoever opens up the, uh, the window first is going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, out the window. And, and that's what these race positions are all about. The question then becomes how to open the window, right? And here's where that metaphor is getting ridiculous, Danny. But seriously, what lines do we want open? It's very important to understand. And, and unfortunately, without a lot of preparation, which uh, is not something that you can always have in these, in these crazy lines, uh, you may make the wrong decision. White's approach in this, in this position is pretty straightforward at this point. And, and once we've induced F6, we know exactly what our anchor is, where the window needs to be opened. That's the pawn we're attacking to open files. But black has a choice to make, A3 or B3. Now, I, I probably would have played the same one that Hikaru did in the game, but as MVL pointed out, actually it was a misevaluation. The best move here was a3, creating the c3 square weakness, and the key is that we not only take f5, but then play e4, trying to punch our way into that square. Of course, white's not going to allow it with d4, but after some crazy ideas like knight takes b3, queen c4 check, uh, 95, of course, if you take the knight, I take you. We get this position here where MVL evaluates it as about unclear. Maybe white still has a tiny edge, uh, but still probably would have been a lot more open open and dynamic for black than what Hikaru got in the game. So that might have been his, his best chance right there. Instead, what we saw was b3 instead of a3. And immediately after rook to g1, Caruana shows just how deep the, uh, the rabbit hole goes or... Whether it was preparation or not, this move definitely makes a lot of sense because if you take, the king just hides himself. It's an umbrella method where you use the pawn as, as the defense against your own king, against the rain, right? So now all of a sudden, black is, is running out of ways to open up new lines against the white king. It's a very important method of defense to understand that shielding approach. So here comes the open files for white. Uh, first c3, of course, guarding some threats. And probably this whole idea was calculated by Hikaru before he played b3, right? But likely what was either 
misevaluated was maybe here he thought he was going to get to the B3 pawn faster or just that didn't under, didn't realize how quickly White's attack was coming. Or again, he underestimated the A3 idea as MVL analyzed. But what's for sure is that I think we will see this interesting line where White castles long in the Berlin again because it seems to create a lot of fun positions. And if Black doesn't play his cards right, he might lose in the same kind of fashion that Nakamura did to Kawana, to Kawana in this game. So after bishop f8, the knight comes to d2. This was just an excellent move. The knight is relocating to right where it needs to be. We're going to take here and punch through on the open lines. So Nakamura says, I can't sit around and wait. And after f takes, g5, rook takes, knight c5. The rook comes back to g3, also very nice. The point is that queen takes d3 fails. Two. We get a trade, and then the knight ends up getting trapped. After some tactics, we win the exchange. So if that doesn't work for black after rook to g3, it's, it's hard to say what will. He played the move queen to d5, and after bishop takes c5, queen takes c5, knight e4, and f6, the position is hopeless. Actually, sorry, that's not, that's not exactly what happened here. Uh, that would have been a hopeless line if he had played for, uh, sorry, if he had played for queen to d5. But e4 was played, sorry. And after bishop takes c5, we get the position we've, we've, we've drawn to here where white is just bringing everybody over to the open files. And uh, after the move, queen to d5 and then just c4. Really, he's just run out, of, run out of moves here. So probably the biggest wrong decision, according to MVL, is, uh, is how to develop the attack, especially where he could have played a3 and then b3. But what's interesting is whether or not this line was, was really, really dangerous for, for black from the start. Uh, there are also options of delaying castling short so quickly as black. MVL does a great job analyzing everything over there. You can check it out. Uh, but with it, we're going to have to hop over to the standings and show that with this big win, Caruana did bring himself back into the fold. Uh, now in third place, only a half a point behind the leaders. That's right where you want to be with seven rounds left if you consider his sort of slow start. Uh, with, uh, with that, we have, of course, the two leaders, Karyakin and Aronian still. You have Anand also right there with Fabiano. Anish still with four, hasn't lost. That's why he's right there at 50%. And then uh, Svidler, Nakamura, and Topalov rounding out the bottom of the field currently. Round nine pairings, there you have it. Topalov will be white against Svidler. Giri will be white against Karwana. Anand will be white against Aronian. And Nakamura gets white against Karyakin, which would be a critical game. Obviously, we, we, we're watching both the leaders get the black pieces. So we'll see what ends up happening as, uh, as they defend themselves against the onslaught. Check it out. Obviously, we have the uh, round nine starting March 21st. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe and give us a share if you love us. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys are enjoying all the analysis. And I will see you after the next round.